within our time period. Thank you all for coming. Get back to it. Um, we are excited about this event. Um, this is our graphic novel symposium. It's supported through Espresso Love, so go over and buy a coffee. Um, also, take time to visit our comic shops and um, check out what they have for sale. Um, today, we are focused on comics in the classroom, which is super exciting. We have two educators that have been good friends to our library and good supporters of our symposium over the last three years. We are welcoming Eric Callenborn from Shepherd and Ronell Whitaker from Richards. Um, teach high school kids, they can tell you more about themselves. These guys go to New York Comic Con, C2E2, big comic cons, spreading the word that comics have big impact in education, big impact in reading, which librarians know, but not everyone in the world knows, so we're happy to have them here. With that, I will turn it over to them. Thanks, guys, for coming. All right, thank you so much. Uh, all right, so uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about ourselves so you can kind of know who we are before we get into the meat of what we have today. We have a lot of meat in our presentation so I hope nobody's vegetarian. Um, I've been teaching for about, thank you, <laughs> been teaching for about 11 years now. Been using comics and graphic novels for probably about the past five or six years. And I teach at Shepherd High School. I have taught every level from the basic of freshmen to the most uh, advanced senior class and everything in between. And I've used graphic novels with all of those courses. Uh, even the senior electives that I teach this year, I'm using a ton novels. Um, like Troy said, we have presented at NCTE, we've presented at the AP conference, we've presented at Comic-Cons, anywhere from San Diego Comic-Con to New York Comic-Con, Denver, all over the country. We've traveled and talked about comics in the classroom, gamification of, of the classroom. Um, we talk about a lot of cool things in the classroom, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Ronell Whitaker. I actually started uh, in the city of Chicago. I taught for two years on the west side of Chicago at uh, Orr High School. And then I came to this district 218. I started at Eisenhower. And this is actually my first year uh, as a Bulldog. So I think I saw a Bulldog shirt out there somewhere. Um, so yeah, I've been teaching for about 11 years now. And I've been using comics for half of that time. And one of the things that I've figured out is no matter what level you teach, comics are just a really engaging way to get information across to people. Um, which we're going to kind of demonstrate today uh, as well. Um, so the one thing we tend to start out with when we do like a just using comics in the classroom presentation is we do kind of like give you a test, right? So if you look up here on this screen here, we have two different sides. One, the only way we would do is we would like break the room into like a left side and a right side. So people on the left, like this way, you all look at the picture, and people on this side, which I guess would be my left, you all try to read the pros here, just the words. Don't look at the image at all. So we'll give you like a couple seconds to do that. And then raise your hand when you have the main idea of the image or the pros. When you understand what's happening. So yeah, as soon like, as you get it, raise As soon as you hand. understand what's happening, raise your hand. All right, image people, you're not helping us. Your <laughs> hand should be up already. <laughs> if you look at the picture, you know what's going on. So what this is supposed to be is kind of a quick visual test. The people who had to look at the image just go, oh, I get what's happening, done. Maybe two, three seconds. People who had the pros to read, though, had to actually unpack every single detail. But what you'll notice is if you, when you look at both of them together, they're actually describing the exact same thing. It's just that one of them gets the information to us a lot quicker. That's because as people, we're, we're kind of trained to read image. We're trained to read visual information. We're not so much trained to uh, read all this text that way really fast. Yeah, our brain processes images at thousands of times faster than it processes words. So it just makes sense that images convey ideas much quicker than words do, which kind of goes to this slide right here. When we are putting together our presentations on, on basically trying to convince people why comics and graphic novels are good, why do you think we have a slide in here of an Ikea store? Does anybody have an idea? of why we may have an Ikea slide up here. Anybody ever bought Ikea furniture? My hand's in the air because I was poor for a long time. Uh, still am. So yeah, we get it, right? It's like it's really good furniture that's really not the best quality maybe, right? But when you have to go put it together yourself, what do you notice about the instructions? Yeah, there's, there's, there's no words. There, there's no words in an Ikea instruction manual. It's all images, right? Because images are universal. 
there, there, you can be, it doesn't matter what language you speak, you're going to be able to assemble that bookshelf just like anybody else. So really, IKEA is building bridges amongst communities and people across the world by, by putting together these, these um, instruction manuals. And we also sometimes use the example of the Heimlich maneuver, like if you're ever in a restaurant, you don't see a big wall of text that says, if someone's choking, get behind them, align your fist with it. No, it's an image. It shows you what to do as fast as you can. It's no, mis it's no mistake that when we're teaching little kids how to read, that we give them picture books. We don't give them full-blown text because we want them to understand how story works, right? So we give them something where they can go, okay, here's what I see happening. Here's a few words to describe it. So even when we're learning to first read, we learn with images. Lego is a big, uh, a big proponent of this as well. If you ever bought any Lego sets and put them together, I mean, not that I go buy Lego sets and put them together like weekly, but if I did, I would know that the Lego instruction booklets, just like IKEA, they don't have any words. It's all images. So no matter what language you speak, no matter where you're from, you're going to be able to assemble that, that Lego piece, uh, which is pretty cool as well. So we, um, we basically, Ronell and I have, like we said, we've traveled all over the country. And at this point, we have about 15 different presentations that we do, anywhere from um, representation in comics to diversifying your classroom bookshelf to characterization, how to use comics to teach characterization. So when we go back to the basics here, when we do this kind of just basic comics presentation, uh, we just kind of want to give you guys an idea of what we do, how we use comics, how we started using them, and, and then answer any questions you may have, because hopefully by the time we've talked for a while, we have some questions out here for us that we can answer. So uh, this presentation is part of a, um, it's part of a basic one that we had done at the AP conference. And one of the first books that a lot of teachers start out by using is the book Mouse, which was written um, and drawn by Art Spiegelman. Uh, how many of you are not familiar with Mouse? Anybody not familiar with Mouse? Oh, uh -huh. cool. All right. So Mouse is his father's true tale of survival in the Holocaust. So he basically went and interviewed his dad over the course of a, a period of time and told his father's story. And the story is told through a kind of a game of cat and mouse where you have uh, the Jewish people are represented by mice, the Nazis are cats, and every group of people in the book have a particular animal that they're associated with. And we talk at length in my classroom as to why he, he represents the, the different types of people as animals. This book is extremely important because A, it is the first graphic novel to ever win the Pulitzer Prize. So, and I believe to this day the only, at this point, the only, the only graphic novel or comic to win the Pulitzer. So if any of you get into a school or district where the, the administration is, is rough to accept it, this is one of the first books you can be like, look, this book won the Pulitzer. So maybe we should consider doing this in the classroom. I replaced Night, uh, Ellie Wiesel's Night. I replaced that book with this in my curriculum because I was just kind of looking for something fresh, looking for something to engage the students in a, in a different way. Because they've had Holocaust training since they're in like what, fourth grade, fifth grade. I mean, they, yeah. they've, they've seen it all. So giving them something like this is, uh, is great. Have you ever taught this, Ronald? Yeah, I, it was one of the first comics I ever taught uh, when I was in the city. And one of the things that I loved about it was the idea that kids could uh, understand ideas like symbolism and imagery a lot faster. Because when you talk about how the mice symbolize Jewish people and how the uh, cats symbolize the Nazis, they go, oh, I get that because those two groups have an adversarial um, relationship already. And, like, and it's light bulbs really fast. So it was really um, just a way to go. I wanted to give my kids a really quick way to be successful. And that's what this book did for them. And it, I, until you've ever given a class set of a comic book or a graphic novel to students, you don't understand how interested they are. Uh, a lot of them will look at it like it's like not a book. Like they don't know what it is. And they'll like turn it upside down and look, look all through it. And they're like, we're not reading a comic book, are we? And it's like, no, we're reading a graphic novel. You can call it a comic book if you want, but I'm going to call it a graphic novel. And one of the first books I taught after Mouse was uh, we have a class set of Spider-Man. And Ronell will speak to Spider-Man as well. It's the... Um, Ultimate Spider-Man, the Ultimate Peter Parker Spider-Man. And I think that it's collected, it's 11 issues. It's a pretty big trade. And I used it with my sophomore honors class and I had a girl who 
held it up and she was like, are you for real giving us Spider-Man? And I'm like, yes, yes, I am. And, and we're going to love it and we're going to read it and we're going to cherish it. And we did a, a whole bunch of activities around this book, Spider-Man. We did a compare contrast essay, a cause and effect essay, a big, big cause and effect essay about the book because I created a lot of cause and effect relationships from the, from the story. And by the end of our time together with that book, I received a note from this girl that said, thank you so much for making us read Spider-Man. I now love Spider-Man, and I'm going to the comic book store and buying Spider-Man comic books. So I'm sure um, her parents might not be happy with the cost of the addiction that some of us know comic books can be. But I immediately changed her perspective on that book. Uh, I just actually got done teaching it again this year. I've been teaching it every year. And I've been teaching for like 11 years. Normally, if I come in, I say, oh, we're going to be reading this book. And people, it's just dead eyes, like, all right, yeah, whatever, bring the book in. I said, I mentioned a week ago we were going to be reading Spider-Man, and it was, like, audible. Yes! Like, people cheering for a book. I'm like, are you, are you cheering a book? Really? That's happening? So I, uh, I was actually really happy to, to get to the point where, where we are now, where kids are excited about reading again. I mean, I think that's kind of the added benefit of comics. I know not everybody's a fan, and I had those kids who are like, oh, we're going to really read a comic. But those are the kids who are sneaking up to me and saying, like, can I take this home so I can finish it? Because we're only reading two issues in that book. We're not even reading the whole thing. So it's kind of like teasing them. They're, like, mad at me now. Um, but it's, 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 been a, it's been an eye-opener. To speak to what uh, Eric said, the way our curriculum is set up is we're only supposed to write, like, certain types of essays uh, d throughout the year. And at this point in the year, we're only supposed to write, like, maybe a two-paragraph essay. Um, but when I started with Spider-Man, my kids knocked that out in the first week. I was like, well, let's see what else you guys can do. So we just got into longer and longer essays way ahead of schedule so that by the time the second semester came, our kids were writing way more detailed stuff because they'd already done the practice with a thing that only took them two weeks to do. Um, if we were reading Night or um, Of Mice and Men, uh, it would take them about four to six weeks just to get through the book. And then I would still find out that most of my kids didn't read those books, even when we read them in class, which was kind of the, um, the negative there. What we found, though, as we've done this, is that when you average together, and Eric did a study about this. He'll talk about that in a second. When you average together just the time spent in reading traditional text versus reading the comic, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Just the time that we save our kids and we kind of can add on now to them actually working on skills is astronomical. This is, uh, I, I had done, I had done um, Beowulf. I was teaching AP Lit at the time, and I had, I took, was taking my wife to the doctor. It's a brief story on how this happened. And I stopped at the library to get a book, because I knew I'd be in the waiting room for a while. And I'm like, you know what, I'm teaching Beowulf. I've heard about this amazing Beowulf graphic novel. So I, I took it out of the library, and I went and I read it in, while I was waiting for her to be done in the doctor's office cover to cover and I was like wow that was the best Beowulf I had ever read and it does have some of that traditional text in it but most of the text is replaced by images and it's done by Gareth Hines and Gareth Hines is a fantastic artist slash um, recreator of classic literature into graphic novels and I brought it to my AP courses and I said all right guys I'm gonna give you a choice we're gonna read Beowulf do you want to read the graphic novel or do you want to read the classic translation uh, I let them choose because choice is always big in the classroom. I always try to give my students choice, uh, whatever we're doing. I, I try not to force anything on them. Let them choose. Then the buy-in is much bigger. So as, as and, and most of the time, this is what happens, especially in an honors class. Half the kids, and this was dead split, half the kids chose the graphic novel and half the kids chose the original text. So I had them keep reading, reading journals, reading logs, and I said, every time you read, I want you to keep note what date, how long did you read from this time to this time, blah, blah, blah. Even if you read Spark Notes, I'm like, be honest. I'm like, if you take the translated text and you go on Spark Notes or you watch part of the movie or whatever you do, I want you to be honest with me. And I'm not mad at you because I want to do this and see where we are. So at the end of the book, as you can see, the students who read the graphic novel spent an average of 2.2 hours admittedly reading the book. The students who read the text spent an hour of 5.7 hours reading the book, and that was with a ton of kids already admitting that they had spark noted about half of it, or they got bored with the original text and they would read it for like an hour, not understand a word of it because they weren't, they weren't actively reading it, and then they would have to go back to spark notes. So they wasted 
hours and hours trying to figure this thing out. Um, when we took the exam on it, uh, what had happened was the students who, this was, this was a multiple choice test that was not geared towards one version or the other, right? This was just a multiple choice test that I had found. The students who read the graphic novel only scored like three points lower than the students who spent 5.7 hours reading. So you have to ask yourself, and, and, and I'll talk to this in a second, but I've done other studies that have shown these numbers to be much better uh, with different texts. But this one, I mean, 3.5 hours, tell me 3.5 hours of study time, of class time, whatever you're doing, isn't worth just three percentage point difference? I mean, I would say that that's a, a pretty substantial uh, reading time compared to these test scores. And when you looked at the essays they wrote, you would not be able to tell, this was only multiple choice, you would not be able to tell which version they read in the essays because they spoke to the text in the same exact way. They talked about theme, they talked about tone, they talked about characterization, they talked about all of these things as if they had read the full text just reading the graphic novel, which I think is amazing for the AP classroom because that means you can get through, like Rondell was alluding to, much more, uh, many more texts and more assignments for those texts. So while there's going to be a class who is uh, punching through another three and a half hours of reading Beowulf, I take that three and a half hours and I'm going to do a bunch of more writing instruction during that time. And, and I'm going to get to more uh, engaging things over the time of that. Anything, anything to that, Renault? Yeah, uh, beyond that, the one thing I've, I've found recently with this is I have kids come up to me and, and say stuff like, this is the first book I've read, like as a senior. This is the first, like, what, what? Like, I, I know what classes you're in, and I know what books you've had to read. And they go, yeah, I, I don't read that. We, we just watched the movie for that. Or I just skipped to the end. Or, or my friend had told me that Lindy got shot in the back of the head. So if you don't know that, sorry, spoiler, spoiler, alert. spoiler, spoiler alert. for Mice and Men. Yeah, Mice and Men. Uh, <laughs> but but that, that's what ended up happening. Like, they, they would kind of fake their way through it. But when I put a graphic novel in, in their hands, it was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to not only finish a book, but I'm going to get it. And then here's what happened. Here was the byproduct of this, this thing. Not only did we finish with speed, but then I'd have, ki I'd, I'd have kids go, well, if this is good, then what else is he going to give me that's also good? So we would go from uh, Amazing or Ultimate Spider-Man to a book called um, American Born Chinese. Uh, it tells the book of the immigrant um, story through a 10-year-old um, or 11-year-old boy. But it's also a frame story, so it's like three different stories happening at one time. So it looks at the immigrant story, but it also looks at what does it mean to have to assimilate into another culture? And wh what does that do to you as a person who's trying to fit, find themselves in a new culture? Really heavy stuff, right? But I had my ninth graders, and I, I only taught at-risk students. So I had ninth graders like digging into this really heavy stuff, talking about the ideas of what does it mean to find yourself as like a dual citizen in, in, a, in a, a, a culture that may not fully understand the culture you came from. So then we went from that, and I said, okay, well, if you read these two graphic novels, let's get into something deeper. So then we read Fences by August Wilson. Fences by August Wilson. August Wilson's one of my favorite writers, and he's a playwright, and this is a play. There's no visual component to it. There's no comic, but what happened was I kind of tricked them into thinking that everything I put in front of them was good. So they figured, well, this has to be good, and they loved it. They loved it. Then I had those same kids later, and I got them to read Kafka's Metamorphosis as a graphic novel. And they were able to talk about a book that should have been above their understanding. But because they, they trusted what I was doing, and they got, oh, I got to read a comic book. It was, they had success, and they had trust in their instructor, and they would go anywhere we asked them to go. And it's kind of, I think, what Eric's seen, too, is the idea that these things kind of just build trust in kids, too. I have created such a, cl uh, a climate of readers in my classroom. I, I brought all my comics and all my graphic novels into my classroom, like from home, all of them. The district bought me a few racks, like comic book spinning racks and, and book racks for my comics, and I keep them all in my classroom. And some kids will wander over, like you can tell they're like not sure if this is like a cool thing to do or not, and I always encourage them. I have some, some my AP class right now, we're not reading any comics right now, although we are gonna be reading March which we can talk about in a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I, I know some students are into some stuff, so I will bring issues of comic books and I'll put them in front of them and I'll be like, hey, uh, you dug that article we read, right? 
why don't you read this? Let me know what you think of it. And they'll be like, all right. And they always come back and they're like, that was great. You got more. That was great. You got more. And I had these two boys last year who were never readers and told me they were never readers. These two boys went to C2E2 with me last year and presented on a panel in front of 150 people yeah. about comics in the classroom saying, I was always a terrible reader and I didn't know what I was doing. And my teachers never gave me anything that helped me get better. And he talked about how he read a lot of comic books when he was younger because it was easier with the words and the images together to grasp meaning. And then he didn't read books for a very long time until I turned him on to the Miles Morales Spider-Man. And he read every single issue that I had. And it was like 35 issues of something at that point. He, he just kept coming back for more and he read every single issue. And when he was done with that, he's like, what else you got, Callum Bourne? I just kept giving him stuff. These kids were reading so much more than they ever had just because we created this culture of this guy's cool, he's into, he's into cool things, and he cares about making class interesting. That is so important, and making class interesting. Um, I want to kind of go back real quick to this. Uh, this was something that I kind of skipped. We talk about like the, um, the impact images can have. I, I don't want to skip over that too quickly because you know this is a visual society. All of our kids are on Snapchat, uh, Instagram, and all of those are all of those are visual mediums, right? Everything, everything that they're into now is all about images, and and we can't discount that. We cannot discount the importance of reading an image. And I like to put this image up when we start reading Mouse. This is um, a, a, a drawing done by Art Spiegelman. It's on the back cover of Mouse, and we usually take a whole class period just to talk about what this image is doing. What's the purpose of this image? How do we know what the purpose of that image is? And we can talk very literary about this image. And, and I'm sure some of you looking at this right now are, are seeing some things in this image that are very impactful, that are very meaningful, very emotional, all right? So we have a man who is writing a book about the Holocaust where the Jewish people are mice. However, he grew up in a world, he grew up in a generation that didn't experience that, but he still comes from that culture hence the mouse mask that he tries to put on when he's writing about his father and his, and, and his family's experiences in the Holocaust. Um, he's smoking because he can't handle the stress of the things and the responsibility that he has as a man who is trying to tell this extremely important story. Uh, we have the guard outside the window constantly looming over him, which can mean any number of things. The whole bottom half of this image is black. So we have a ton of blank space, although the top half, there's so many colors and so many interesting things happening in this image. So when I introduce comics a lot of the time, I put this image up, and I'm like, let's talk about this in a very real way. And I think having a discussion about this image, it's like having a discussion about a piece of art at the Art Institute of Chicago. I mean, we can make, have those same discussions, and, and there's not much difference between discussing a short story and a, a piece of, of comic book or graphic novel. It's just a couple of vocabulary words that are different. The biggest difference I've found, though, is that kids are less afraid to be wrong about talking about pictures because they see what they see. And they've kind of grown up saying, well, I see this. So it's a lot easier for them to just point at a thing and say, oh, well, I noticed this part in that picture. Whereas with text, it's very forced in the way that you are uh, supposed to experience the story. Kids can kind of wander around an image and find their own meaning and then I think that makes it a lot easier for kids to want to talk about stuff. One, so of my, one of my students was like, so that side panel, like the side table that's kind of going off into the blackness, that's like uh, there's pencils and there's uh, brushes and stuff on there, right? There's like art supplies on there. So he said, uh, Mr. Calmborn, like that thing just kind of jutting out into the darkness, is that him afraid that his art means nothing? And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, dude, what? I'm like, I, I had to just, I was like, I had to give that kid a candy bar. I'm like, here you go. I'm like, I, I yes, I never thought of that before. And every once in a while, too, like when you're reading a, a book in a class and a kid will make a connection or, or, or assume something because his life or her life history has been different than yours, and they make a connection that you didn't see, and it just becomes amazing. You had that experience with um, Romeo and Juliet. Didn't you have some of those experiences, too? Yeah, I had an experience um, with, we were reading Romeo and Juliet, the graphic novel by Gareth Hines. And there's a panel where, if you know the play, there's a character named Mer Mercutio. He's kind of a weird character. His uh, characterization is all over the place. So we were just flying through it, and I would just say, all right, let's look at this image. What do you guys notice? 
And I just expected him to point out, oh, well, he's standing here with the, with the sword and he's dancing or whatever. And he was. The character was in a pose where he was, he was like teasing his friend with the sword. But this one kid goes, look at his shadow. His shadow's doing something totally different. And I was like, what? What? Ah, right, get out of here with that. Like, because the, 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 the thing is, you think they're trying to distract you because that's kind of like a kid's job. But then we looked at it and it's like, oh, wow, this, this kid noticed something that's like way different. So I was like, all right, well, like, what do you think that might mean about him? Like, why would his shadow be doing something different than what he is? And this kid goes, because he's unpredictable. Like, you can't see what he's going to do. And I was like, look at, look at you understanding the character that if we just read this play and you'd be like, what's a thou? What's a thy? What's a maidenhead? What is, what is all this? Okay? But by giving them a chance to just dive deep into an image, kids found way deeper stuff than we would have found if we just cursorily read it. And that's our plug for using Shakespeare, um, which is uh, another another um, panel that we do, which is the importance of using sh uh, graphic novels to teach Shakespeare. Because if, if you've ever heard me talk about comics or you ever hear me talk about comics again, I say this every time, uh, Shakespeare never wrote his plays to be read by high school students. He wrote his plays to be read by actors so it could be performed. Okay, That play was never meant to be read. It was meant to be watched. Mm -hmm. So... Why not use a graphic novel to teach it? Because you're watching it on the pages. The person, the artist, and the, the artist of that book is the director of that play, and you are watching it unfold. That's why I never understand when uh, a department, uh, a department or an administration has a hard time using graphic novels to teach Shakespeare. Because, like, would you take your kids to go see it at Chicago Shakespeare? Yes. Well, this is what you're doing, except you're not spending money on buses and, and play tickets. Like, you, you, you're, you're showing them the play, and you can talk about the director's decision. Don't sit around and read Shakespeare in class. Like, <laughs> it's not what it was meant to be. Anyway, I digress. Uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare should be, you try graphic novels. If, if those of you who are teaching or going into teaching and you have to teach a Shakespeare play, try to use a graphic novel to do it. And there are good ones. There are bad ones that the kids are going to hate, and there are good ones. So um, when you leave here, you can get our business cards. I'm on one side, Ronell's on the other. This is how closely we work together. Um, so you can contact us, and we will give you titles for you to try. There are some really, really, really amazing Shakespeare graphic novels and some really poor ones as well. We do. Um, the, websites, the websites are on the cards as well. I am uh, – Ronell is the comicbookteacher.com. I'm the other first. comicbookteacher.com. So I have, um, and also, we have, like, these are, this is a packet th for people starting to teach comics. Uh, on my website, I have a resources tab, and it has a ton of resources for teachers to, to download and use. Uh, PDFs, handouts, uh, if you've never taught a graphic novel, it gives, NCTE has a packet of terminology, and there's uh, worksheets that we've created that go along with that packet from NCTE. Please feel free to steal all of it. I've Usually. actually heard from parents, too, who use us just to kind of get their reluctant readers into reading stuff. They always ask us about books they could be reading. Um, we want to kind of fast forward to now and then kind of, if we have time for questions, really quick. Um, now what we're doing, this is like kind of older for us because like now we've kind of branched out. Erica's teaching an entire class uh, built around comics, just the entire class is comics. Uh, I only have one class I teach now because I'm a technology coach, but I use a lot of um, comics in my classroom. So now it, it's funny how the world has changed in that short amount of time for us because five six years ago when we started with this there were very few resources we wanted a few people doing this and people weren't taking comics seriously now fast forward to now and um john lewis congressman john lewis if you don't know who he is just think of martin luther king and go oh john lewis was there for all of that stuff um if you ever saw the movie selma john lewis is a character in that movie uh, because he's a real person so John Lewis was one of the founding members of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, and he decided that he wanted to write his biography, or, or autobiography, because he wrote it himself. Um, and rather than write a dry book, his aide, Andrew Iden, uh, kind of said, hey, why don't we do it as a comic? Because the thing that kind of influenced you into getting into the Civil Rights Movement was the comic. I don't know if people know this, but if, like way when the Civil Rights Movement was just starting, um, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, and the people who were around that movement wrote a comic called Martin Luther King Jr. and the Montgomery Bus Boycott. And really, the whole purpose of that comic was to educate people on how to um, nonviolently protest. And people like John Lewis read it, and they're like, oh, this is what this is? I can do this. So fast forward to now, and he says, well, yeah, I, I think we have a new generation of people to kind of educate about 
protest and about how to affect change in their lives. So I'm going to write my book, uh, my, life about my, my book about my life as a comic. We read this comic in our classes now. And when I say that it does the best job of putting people in the movement I, that I've ever seen, um, it literally walks you through what it was like to start um, the civil rights movement and what it was like to live during that time. And I've had so many kids who've read it who will say, like, I've read so many books, I've read so many articles about Martin Luther King, and it's always the same stuff. But when they read this, they felt as if they finally knew what that struggle looked like. Um, I've also started recommending this book to people. It's a big, massive book, The Hip Hop Family Tree. Uh, it's fun because it documents the start of hip hop uh, in the boroughs of New York. Um, it has a little bit of language, so I can't use it in my class. But I can kind of sneakily go, hey, you should probably read this if you like music. And they'll read it, and then they'll go, well, do you have anything else? And then I can kind of point them to like more stuff. There's Volume actually, two. <laughs> there's actually four of these out now. Uh, my wife got really jealous because I got the fourth one. She normally hates when I buy comics. But the fourth one has this big, crazy image of salt and pepper with the huge earrings on. So she loves that one. Um, there's a book right here to Eric's Far, Far Left, The Gettysburg Address. Um, this is a book that actually uh, store, not fictionalizes, but it like adds a story behind the writing of the Gettysburg Address. Um, the same writer, Jonathan Hennessy, wrote a graphic novel of the Constitution. And the reason why I love that so much, how many of you all know what the Eighth Amendment is? Crickets, right? I, don't, I didn't know it for a long time. A friend of ours uses that book in his class, and it's like, oh, that's what that is? Okay, I get it. Like, it's one of those things where kids have a bunch of, oh, I get it moments, because they get to see something in action. He's a lot of metaphors. He's a lot of, uh, he uses a lot of metaphors in his book to, to make connections to the uh, amendment, so it makes it easier, uh, easier to recognize. One of, the, one of the, going along with that, one of the presentations we also do, we have a social studies one. We have social studies teachers in our group that just use, that's just social studies, um, nonfiction. We have, a sci we have science teachers in our district that are using comics and graphic novels for chemistry to kind of um, illustrate different types of uh, chemical reactions through like the Fantastic Four and, um, and uh, what is that, uh, uh, Dragon Ball Z and stuff yeah. like that. Physics in Deadpool. Um, this is a manga math book, which might have helped me learn math because I hated it. <laughs> uh, so this might have actually been a good way to kind of get me to actually want to learn some math because it adds a story to it. Um, a, a friend of mine, actually, his son is nine and doesn't read anything. And over the summer, I gave him this book. This book is called How Tunes, and it's, it's a story but it's all like experiments, how to build like little science contraptions. And like that kid poured through this and my friend's house is wrecked because of all these experiments, but that kid read it though. And like now he's, you know, he wants to read more and more stuff. Eric is doing something really cool now in his class um, with comics uh, where we have, the thing about comics is really great is that he made a connection with the publisher of those comics, which means we can now talk to the artists, the writers behind those. I don't know if you guys, when you were younger, if you had like a writer come in and talk to you about their book. Um, but I've had multiple writers talk to my kids about their books now because I just hit them on Twitter like, my kids liked your book. And they go, great, can I talk to your kids about my book? And we just have them uh, talk to our kids about them. I, I've been able to set up interviews. Uh, I do a lot of real world assessments in my classroom. So students will do blog posts, students will do interviews, they'll do podcasts, like legit real world stuff. And I had a girl want to do a review of this book called Tomboy. Uh, Liz Price wrote this book, and I love the book. And I had reached out to her when I was done reading it, and I was like, I loved your book. Thank you for writing it. And she was like, cool. Whatever you need, let me know. And um, I had this girl read it, and she was like, that was amazing. And I was like, you want to interview the author? And she's like, what? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like well, I've talked to her before. She's really cool, and I think she'd be willing to interview, uh, do an interview with you. So she's like, yes. So I contacted Liz, and she said she'd be happy to do it. The girl wrote up 10 questions, sent them over to her. Uh, they had an email exchange. She answered all of her questions, and then the girl wrote a blog post where she then uh, used Liz's responses in her blog post about the review of that book. And it is, it's an amazing thing. I, we're reading this book right now called Harbinger. It's a valiant title that has just been announced that they're going to make a movie out of it. And... The author, I, I, I tweeted a, a stack of 30, 35 books that I had that we were reading it, 
and the author was like, that's amazing. Like, these people can't believe that we're using their books in the classroom, which is kind of cool. And I tweeted back at them, and I was like, hey, when they're done reading it, will you Skype conversation with our kids? He's like, absolutely, whatever you need. So our kids are now going to be able to Skype conversation with the author of this graphic novel that has just been commissioned into a film, which will come out in a couple of years. So they're going to be like, I talked to the writer of that story that was made into that movie. And it's just having those like unique cultural experiences that you just you can't get by re by reading um uh, you know a lot of classics and i'm not i'm not saying to get rid of classics i'm saying there's alternatives we're we're saying there's alternatives out there to do some really amazing cool things in the classroom that kids love and that nobody's really doing the uh, author of this book art spiegelman a famous quote of his is comics are the gateway drug to reading we always talk about how we love these comics and we love to have kids read them, but we also know that they'll, they'll lead them into more reading. Like That's the biggest goal. It's not that we want to just have kids only read comics. It's that we know that once they figure out, oh, I kind of like reading, then they'll read more. And, that, that's, and that's the end goal for that. Um, we have time for questions if anybody wants to ask. High school. Not only do I think it, it would, I know it does. And Can I, I you repeat the, qu repeat the question? Uh, so the, the question is, do we think that uh, comics could work uh, at a college level? And uh, we know it does, because we've talked to authors whose books are being used in college. Um, there's a book called Fun Home uh, by Allison Bechtel. Um, and you might, you might know the name Bechtel, because Bechtel is, there's a thing called the Bechtel test, or Bechdel test, where, um, and it's not, flawless, but it, it's, it's kind of like to test whether a book um, stands the test of do female characters interact with one another in a way that's not simply based around men or the interact, interaction with men. So she's a really strong uh, feminist voice in literature. But this book is a, uh, a uh, autobiography about growing up in her home, and it was actually recently turned into a musical, won a bunch of Tonys, and she uh, is a MacArthur genius now because of this book. Um, so there are a bunch of, of uh, schools who use that book in their, in their classes. I, I had a class at Governor State, um, and the professor used uh, Jimmy Corrigan's Smartest Kid on Earth. It's a Chris Ware book. Chris Ware is a Chicago, a Chicago guy. He doesn't do a ton of appearances, but, man, his stuff is so good. It's so good. I, it was the first, that was the first time that a, uh, a graphic novel ever made me cry. It was just like one little thing, and it. it was just so tiny and minute, but it hit me on such an emotional level that I was like, this is, and it was in college, and I was like, this, that was, one of the, that was one of the things, too, that planted the seed in my head that I should start using these books in my classroom um, when, when I had to read that. It, it's called Jimmy Corgan's Smartest Kid on Earth. It's brilliant. It's such an amazing book. Um, so, yes, the college level, there, I mean, the discussion, imagine, imagine this discussion on this image in, in a COM 101 class instead of, like, a sophomore high school class. Like, hopefully, the maturity level is there a little bit more where you can even get even more in depth on these and the discussions you can have with the kids. So yeah, I would say by all means, more college professors uh, should be using comics and graphic novels. Oh, yeah, I, I used uh, Sin City and uh, Persepolis and, and uh, uh, Mouse and uh, trying to think what else, my lit classes. But one of the choices that they have is they, they do uh, comparison contrast essays of films and, and uh, texts. So they can compare a graphic novel with a, you know, movie version. And some people have done Watchmen. Like I never yeah. taught that, but, but the author of Watchmen hates movie versions of his text. Yeah, I know. Uh, no, Alan Moore. Alan Moore. He thinks the movies make him dumber, and in his case, he's right. <laughs> people always say that bad dialogue is like comic books, but a lot of times the movies are dumber. And even outside of a literature class, um, you could even have these kind of discussions in classes based around culture. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, and I never know how to say his name, so I just say it real fast so we don't catch it. Um, he's actually, I mean, he's famous for writing a great book on um, you know, the discourse around race uh, in this country called Between the World and Me, and now he's writing uh, Black Panther. Um, it will be a really cool discussion to have to talk about um, that interplay 
in between this, what this superhero is going through and possibly what it might have been or how it might relate to uh, his nonfiction book about what it means to grow up as a black man in America. Um, there's so many different places you can go with comics. It doesn't have to be in you know, a lit class or in a high school class. You can definitely take it to college as well. Yeah, the, the new, the new, a lot of the new stuff that's coming out is very politically driven. It's very, uh, I, I'm gonna not, I don't mean hostile, but it creates, it, like uh, Captain America, Sam, Wils, uh, Sam, Sam Wilson, Captain America, Sam Wilson, yeah? Yeah. Was number one, was made it on Fox News. Like Fox News was talking about this new Captain America because he was stopping, there was this group of bad guys who were killing people who were crossing over the border into the United States from Mexico. They were kidnapping them and torturing them. So Captain America is like, no, you can't do that. And Fox News was like, is Captain America pro-immigration? Like, what? And, but it was, I made the news and they were talking about it on the news and I was like, this is crazy that Captain America, they're talking about it on Fox News. And there are things coming up all the time in current comics that, that are, are fueled by politics. Like Captain America also, a few months ago came out, like we found out he was like a Hydra agent. And people were like, wait, what does this mean? What is, and then there was a huge discussion that was about, what does this mean to the Jewish community? Because Captain America was such a huge proponent against the Holocaust. And are you saying now that that whole thing was, was, was wrong? And it, it, these discussions are happening almost uh, weekly or monthly now with the new stuff that's coming out. And yeah, it's not just the literature classroom anymore. I would, you, could, you could teach a class on ethics. Uh, I mean, any history classes, all of these, there's bleed into all of it. Uh, other questions at all? Please. Got another one, okay. Wait for the mic. Oh. I found out your Batman for President t-shirt is awesome. I Thank like you. <laughs> That's who I'm putting down in my ballot. Oh. <laughs> Anyway, um, how did you go about incorporating, I mean, how did the administration like the idea of you incorporating graphic novels into your curriculum? I want to give a shout out to Mike Jacobson. He loves when we say his name. If I say it like five times, he'll show up like Beetlejuice. So he was our, he was our boss. And he actually, like, we were using comics here and there. But he approached me when I was teaching this class of some of our at-risk students, and he said, hey, would you, would you want to teach Spider-Man? And I said, I, I teach the crap out of that, if you let me. <laughs> and uh, I didn't say crap. So he um, gave me that book, and like we ran with it. Uh, I would say to, to an administration that's maybe oppositional, though, I would go back to what Eric's point was. Um, at this point now, we have a ton of research that kind of backs up how um, helpful and beneficial comics can be to kids. So you can definitely point your uh, administration to that. I would also point them to data because that's the favorite word of it, education administrators, data. Um, that kind of shows the impact that it can have on readers. Um, and then I would just give them the book, the book that you want them to read. Okay. Because then it becomes, are you just gonna willfully ignore this? And then that's on that, then it's on them. But if it's I've done the work, I've done justification, and now it's in your hands to like, you know, check it out, then it's up to them. Last year, beginning of the school year, uh, we, it was about October, November, what school board meeting we did, right? We were asked, uh, there was like four teachers in our district that were, that are strong in using comics, and we were asked to give a presentation to the school board about why, like why, but they, and we had this like hour and a half presentation ready, they're like, you have 15 minutes. Like, all right then, um, we need to edit this down to 15 minutes because we could talk about this all day. And they, it wasn't like a prove yourself. It was, the conversation was more like they were really interested because they heard that we were presenting on this across the country and that kid, the growth was, was up and kids were engaged. So they really just wanted to know what we were doing. And we presented to the school board and they loved it. Like we had a lot of, you know, the typical, I had a lot of my data slides up there. And if you do go to my resources part of the website, I actually have my master's thesis I wrote about comics in the classroom, so I do have a lot of stats and numbers you can use on there if you want. Um, but they were just so excited that we were trying these innovative things. We kind of got lucky to fall into a district that was very supportive from day one, whereas the school district I started my career in, they still don't allow teachers to use comics or graphic novels, and that's 11, 12 years now, and they still don't. The, the, the department chair there is like, you will not be using a comic book in my classroom. And that's what was the reason for that? 
because it's because it's not canon because it's comics not, are not real books. comics are not real books yeah you know it's it's there are a few there are there's a handful of people that are just afraid to give up the reins you know of of the old dead white men that we've read in high schools for so long and I, they're afraid they're afraid that that maybe it's the dumbing down although it's totally not um, but they're just afraid of the unknown. I think that's what it is. There's it, also a fear that maybe parents won't support it either. So in that res respect, it kind of becomes, well, maybe you get some parents to kind of help with that too. Because I know that once my parents saw, oh, you have my son reading, you have my daughter reading, and like they're bringing this home and they're talking to me about books, then they were like, we're going to support this all the way. That's a so big question too about the parent support. And Ronell and I haven't seen anything but positive interactions with parents about this. Mm -hmm. Not one negative comment from a parent in the five years we've been teaching with comics and graphic novels. Kay. Any other final questions? Yes. Um, do you guys have these books available like in Spanish or any other language? Yeah, okay, so that's, I love that question. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I taught at Eisenhower and I had a bunch of our ELL um, teachers like ask me that. So the first thing I did was go to Amazon because they want to sell everything. And more likely than not, many books are translated in Spanish. Um, there's still a long way to go. Um, but if you, if you just search for us or different languages, like uh, different translations, I bought three books that I gave to kids, uh, to my ELL teachers. One of them was The Walking Dead, that's in Spanish, which, okay. But like, I gave them to them and that, that book disappeared. They haven't seen that book in a year now because it's been circulating among all of the kids. I gave them a couple of other books. One um, is about this cat who goes around solving crimes. Uh, and it's actually, it's not a baby book. It's like, it's a really good book. But it's, it's, um, it was originally written in Spanish. Because people don't know this, but in Europe, comics are like a real, like they're real books. They're celebrated. So if, even if you can't find like mainstream books, I would just search for like what's big in you know, Spain and, and what's big in France. Because those books are going to be in their native language. And that means it won't have to be translated. It'll be in its original, you know, meant to be, you know, form. Okay. And a quick commercial, mo not all, but most of the books they have up here are actually in our library's collection. So I know we have a lot of our education students here. And our library specializes. We do have some capes and tights and some classic superhero. But we have many books that are nonfiction. We have many books that are other types of stories, memoir. Um, not just superhero kinds of things. So we really have worked in our library to have a diversity of things in our collection that might be worth knowing about. And a couple books that you hold up, I know we have one right here, that are um, books for educators with lesson plans and things like that. Like how to <laughs> use. So um, already made, ready to go. So those books hey, exist. We, know so. we do know these people. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, how about a round of applause? Thank you guys. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for and coming. have a good day. Thanks. Thanks, guys. We're, come take a business card. Come chat. Say hi. We yeah. appreciate it. Thank you.